What's up y'all, it's Shuffle back again with some more videos. This time we are going to help out the new players with some starter teams because this is a question I've been getting the last few days, especially because of the videos I've been putting out and the Game Pass and PS4 sale, all of that cool stuff. So for starter teams, we are going to talk about some stuff that's pretty easy to use and I'll talk about how to gear them, stuff like that. And there are some that are a little more tricky to play than others, but don't worry too much and I'll give you a quick tutorial on how to use them. So before we get started, make sure you check out my Twitch channel. I stream four days a week, join Discord if you want to come hang out with cool people. And if you like the stuff, support on Patreon. All of that is fantastic and comes with their own perks. So the first team that we're talking about, this is actually the usual suspects. And don't freak out here, but my background has like all bunch of quest stuff here. But this team is called Tricky Glory. Normally this is Team Red Hook. And if you move it the other way, it's the usual suspects. But the reason... I would actually tell you to start it in this order is specifically because of Highwayman and how this character plays. But we're gonna start with Crusader. So pretty simple stuff. We're gonna be running Smite. We have Stunning Blow. Stunning Blow is just a really good move. We have Holy Lance to move around in case stuff happens or we get moved out of position because sometimes, you know, you can get title slammed in the cove. That does happen. And then we have Inspiring Cry to Stress Heal and do some Spot Healing. You can swap in Battle Heal for something if you really want to, but I don't think you need Bulwark of Light and definitely not Zealous Accusation, there's just not a build that needs that. And for Trinkets, anything that gives you some accuracy, because we don't have really any other way to get accuracy besides Quirks, so having accuracy with Focus Ring or Warrior's Cap or Reckless Charm, those are some low level options. Surgical Gloves are very good as well. So anything that gives you some accuracy is good enough here. Then Paralyzer's Crest I like quite a bit. This makes sure that your stun sticks somewhat reliably. But this is your most flexible slot. This could be something defensive. This could be a survival guide. This could be, like I said, defensive resist trinket. This could be sign conscription or ancestor scroll if you have those as well to boost your stress healing. Those are all fine and dandy. For Vestal, we're going to run the stock Vestal setup, which is just the four middle skills. This is the premier Vestal healing loadout. So we have Judgment to zap things in rank 4, because this team kind of struggles with reach a little bit. And we have Dazzling Light, just because the stun's good. Then we have the two heals. Her trinkets are pretty flexible. Usually I give her one healing trinket and then something else. In this case, I'm just putting the map on her just to give her some utility. And the map, if you watched my last video, this is something that we can swap around to other people. So that's pretty cool. For... Highwayman. So the reason we start him in three or potentially four is because like the more experience that myself and others have gotten collectively as a community, as good as point blank shot is, you usually want to have Highwayman get his repost up and then start cleaning up the back, uh, back ranks before doing anything else. And if you put him in rank two where Vestal's at and then you duelist up front, and then use point blank shot, you're leaving rank four and three open. So being able to start him in three is good because you get to duelist on turn one, that gets your post up, and then he's in rank two, and he can use everything that's not point blank shot. So you can still use pistol shot and shoot rank four or rank three. So those are the squishy stress casters. Those need to go down first in most cases. Then you also have your melee move. If you leave him in rank 3, for some reason, if you don't want a duelist advance, you can still shoot and use your melee, which is good. These are both, you know, solid moves. Wicked Slice also very good. So leaving him there and giving him the flexibility and reach is very, very nice. Since we don't have access to accuracy, if you have, like, the Crimson Quartz set, you can put it here, but just another low-level option or non-DLC option is we have the Sun Ring. This thing is solid enough. It gives you some damage and accuracy. And then we have Surgical Gloves, which is to help boost our Repost accuracy, because Repost has, I believe, 85 accuracy at, I think at all times? I was going to say at max level, but I'm pretty sure it's always 85. And that's just bad. So this this helps it. This puts it up to 95, which is okay. Like, you're still going to miss stuff. You know, that's only like a 61% chance to hit Cultist Switch. That's kind of crappy. But it's better than nothing. So we can use Duelist to go into rank 2, and then we have Pistol Shot and we have Melee, and that's pretty much how this character plays. Plague Doctor is pretty simple for this one. So we have two Blade moves, we have Blinding Gas, which is amazing, then we have Battlefield Medicine. This is a flexible one. Usually Vestal can out-heal most damage over time effects, but you really don't want to get crit 
you know, you don't want to eat like a big crit with a blight on top of you, so Plague Doctor does deal with that very nicely. So I would still recommend leaving this on, but you can swap this for Blast if you really want to. But I've found this is good enough in most cases, especially because we have two stuns that can hit the front rank, so we don't really need Blast after that. For Plague Doctor, there are... Or I should say, it's very hard to recommend something that replaces Blasphemous File. So for you new players, whenever you beat a boss, you're guaranteed to get an Orange Trinket. So you can wait and save your early boss kills until this pops up. And I would recommend you do that if you like Plague Doctor, because this character is pretty strong without this, but this character becomes like an S tier character when you put this on. This covers so many options, and the bonus 25 stress penalty isn't really a big factor, because Plague Doctor is fast enough to stun most backlines and not get hit with a stress attack. Sometimes she gets hit by one just because they, you know, outspeed her. But for the most part, she can control a backline while the rest of your team cleans it up. So you get the stun, you get all those juicy stats, you can put a play grenade down the next turn, and then Dismiss and Vestal are hitting the back ranks after you use your first duelist. You probably duelist in rank three, and then Zap rank four, and that's pretty solid. That usually gets through a backline in a couple turns, which is good enough. Your second trinket, I'd recommend something that gives you speed. There are a lot of speed trinkets out there, like Feather Crystal or Swift Cloak, for instance, or you can put on Witch File if you're low level, but something like Prophet's Eye is really good. This is speed, minus stress to offset the file penalty, and then more accuracy to hit those backliners. This is probably the best stun setup for her trinkets, but there's, uh, there's other things you could use as well. On your first turn, if you're going to stun literally everything on the board, you actually don't want to use Duelist Advance. You can if you want to, there's really no penalty to doing it, but you lose turns off of your Duelist Advance Repose Timer because everything's stunned and nothing's attacking you. But what you can do is either Pistol Shot into rank 4, or into rank 3, or Duelist into rank 3. Those are all acceptable openers. And then you can use Blinding Gas, and then you can use the other two stuns and lock down the entire enemy team. I'd almost not recommend stunning all four enemies unless you can guarantee some kills because if you stun all four enemies and you can't kill anything and then they all go next turn and you can't kill anything, you get hit in the face four times, which is not what we want to do. We usually want to disrupt the enemy as much as possible, but that means sometimes you may want to stun three instead of all four, but it really is something that comes with experience. Otherwise, Plague Doctor opens with Blinding Gas. I think that's pretty standard. Like, there are some arguments to open with Plague Grenade, but they are... It's not the, the starter strategy anymore. I think it's just pretty much agreed on that opening with stun is better to slow down the stress that you're taking, even though Play Grenade opener is more damage. So what you want to do is open with Blinding Gas, and then turn two, Play Grenade, and then turn three, Blinding Gas. And usually everything is dead or dying in the back line at that point. And then afterwards, Plague Doctor can chip in with Noxious Blast to make things miss the or, uh, your party while they chip down with Blight, and then use Battlefield Medicine as needed. Bestel, like I said, she's going to stun on the first one or two turns, maybe use a Judgment, then turns three and four, she is healing, and then Crusader is opening with a stun, and then once you need him to do some damage after the backline's gone, and he doesn't have to stress heal anyone, you can start using Smite and Chop through the front. With a team like this that has this much control, you want to leave one very easy to deal with enemy up front, so that's either a stress caster that has somehow made it up to the front of the party and it doesn't use its main stress attack anymore, or this is like some kind of tank enemy, like a pelagic guardian in the cove, which uses Octocestus when it's by itself, but that's not too detrimental. You can heal through that, you can corral that by stunning it and blighting it and stuff like that. So you want to kill the the back line as fast as possible kill the next like big melee uh, threats after that and then just stall for like one or two turns to heal up because this team does have a lot of recovery. The second team is one of my favorites. This is a Grave Robber team. Obviously we have Abomination and Hellion. Vessel is just there to keep everything safe but Vessel can be replaced with some like Plague Doctor and then this team becomes the Four Horsemen which it, it's cool. It's a name team and all that but for this team we are using a couple things here. We have a lot of control so kind of like the last team where there's a lot of stuns, stuns keep you safe. This is why I usually try and have a couple on the team. And for this team we have stuns from three different heroes, but also we have some reach, which is something the other team kind of struggled with just a little bit. So we have Iron Swan from Hellion to reach into the back. We have rank three reach with If It Bleeds, 
Wicked Hack can be bleed out if the area you're going to has bleed susceptible enemies. And then you don't usually need these two, but sometimes Breakthrough's kind of nice in case you think you're going to get knocked out of position. You can get rid of Yop in that case. And then we just have a bunch of accuracy because even though Hellion's accuracy is okay at 105, uh, she has to hit the back line with Swan, which means she needs a lot more accuracy to hit those units. So you have to get as much as you can in a lot of cases. And even then, she may not hit them. She's probably chilling at like 81%, something like that at this point, on something like Bone Cordier, which kind of sucks. But this is the best she can do in that situation besides just stacking like another 10 accuracy trinket. For Abomination, this is a human Abomination team. This is not a Transform Abomination team. If you do not have DLCs, you do not get Broken Key, and that kind of sucks because this character was redesigned, or I should say balanced around Broken Key, with the way Manacles currently works. So Broken Key fixes the accuracy issue that Beast Abomination has, and then also you get a bunch of stun chance, and then you have Padlock of Transference, which gives you more stun chance, which means that you can actually stun lock stuff pretty reliably. You're up to 185 stun chance at max rank, which is pretty phenomenal, if I can say so myself. If you do not have the Color of Madness DLC, this could be some other form of accuracy. This could be like Ancestor Signet Ring or uh, a Focus Ring if you really want to. Something like that, just to, like I said, lock up the rest of the accuracy that you're going to need. But it, this team really feels better, at least Abomination feels better, when you have access to DLC items. Actually, Grave Robber too. So for Vestal, we talked about her earlier, this is the exact same setup. I talk about this in like every single team video that I make that has Vestal, so it's just as optimized as it can be in terms of moves, and then support trinket, healing trinket. For Grave Robber, she's kind of flexible here, so you can run darts instead of throw dagger, but you only want one of these, you don't want both of these. So the whole goal of this build is to lunge into rank three on turn one. So that gets rid of, hopefully it gets rid of the stress caster. You're gonna have to crit if you're playing Blood Moon or Stygian, but on Darkest, I think you can high roll and get a couple of them. And then also Abomination can help finish it off, and then you have Reach on the other two, so that's always good. But you want to get rid of rank 3 on turn 1. And then like I said, Hellion Iron Swan's turn, or rank 4 on turn 1. And then after that, Grave Robber on turn 2 or whatever can Shadow Fade, and then either decide to lunge again, or throw a dagger and help Hellion finish off rank 4. The reason you need Pick is because sometimes Grave Robber is sitting in rank 2, or sometimes rank 1 if something happens and you don't quite want her to move out of position yet, so you need some kind of move to use in rank 1. Grave Robber cannot use any other attack besides Shadow Fade, which is not an attack, from rank 1. So if she gets stuck up there and she needs something to do and you don't have pick, she can't do anything. So that's why we always run pick, just because those situations happen and you don't want to have her be the last surviving member of a team wipe and then she has no way to kill the remaining enemies. So that's why we run pick. So it should always be Shadow Fade, Lunge, Pick, and then one of your choice of range moves. I forgot to mention Trinkets. So this is a high level set. We have Raider's Talisman, which is just fantastic. All these stats are incredible on Grave Robber. The minus HP kind of hurts, but she's able to go into stealth, so it doesn't matter as much as you would think. And then there's some people that say she doesn't need the extra speed, and I think Grave Robber always needs at least like two or four extra speed to make sure she can go before most rank three enemies and kill them. So that's why we always run something like Raiders. And then Letter Opener is just incredible stats for one trinket. Like this is 25% damage and 10 accuracy on pick and lunge and then five dodge on top of it. Like there are no downsides. There, there's nothing, this, this thing's incredible. There's no reason not to run this if you have Crimson Court and you found it. As I was saying before, the way this team operates is Grave Robber lunges into rank three at the start of the turn. Hopefully she kills it if she doesn't then Abomination is pretty flexible in how he helps clean it up. He can either use Beast Bile if it's at like 6 HP or lower, so you can just finish it off with uh, damage over time, or you can hit it with Manacles, which stuns it, and then you can figure out what to do with it later, or you can run if it bleeds, or use if it bleeds, I should say, to finish it that way. Usually don't have to, especially because Hellion is trying to use Iron Swan on turn one, and then after that, Grave Robber gets to decide, do I Shadow Fade to reposition, and then, do I lunge after that, or do I throw dagger, or do I just throw dagger for rank, uh, rank 2? Do I use pick after that? There are a couple options. Usually she isn't using pick on turn 2, so it's going to be lunge, and then either shadow fade or throw dagger, depending on how low the rank 4 dude is, if it's not dead already. And then turn 3, if you didn't shadow fade, you're probably shadow fading. So pretty easy to deal with. The thing I always hear about Grave Robber players, or like when people start playing Grave Robber, 
is they say that they don't want to build a team around dancing, and this team is not built around dancing. We just have two people in the middle with Vestal and Abomination who don't care if Grave Robber is in front of them or behind them. So that's all you really need for a dance team like this, is you just need the team to be able to operate when the dancing character or characters are in the first position and in the second position. You don't need anything crazy like the whole team doing Infinite Lunge. You don't need that. Abomination and Vestal are stunning, usually the frontliners on turn 1, unless they're stunning rank 3, depends on what the threat level is. So you just lock down the front line, finish off rank 3, kill rank 4 at the start of uh, turn 2 hopefully with Grave Robber if it's low enough, and then sometimes you need another Iron Swan which feels bad, but it does happen. And so after that you are out of threatening backline targets with two frontliners that you can just stun the hell out of and control from there and you have a decent amount of healing from not just Vestal but Abomination's Absolution. So this team looks a little complicated at first but it's honestly pretty easy once you play it for like a couple missions. This next team is something I believe Thick came up with and this team is actually pretty sick. This is a Jester Mark team. So normally Mark for Death is these three characters without Jester and then has Houndmaster. But the issue with Mark for Death normally is that it's kind of slow in terms of actual speed, unless it can camp. And Jester really ties all of this together very nicely, and it's pretty awesome. So if you haven't played something like this, I suggest you do. And for those of you wondering, Occultist does incredibly well in the front line. So people think that he's really squishy, he shouldn't be up there, his stats defensively are kind of low. He does have 30 dodge, which is solid. But it's the fact that he has Hands from the Abyss. This move is absolutely nuts, and it gets so much support from Trinkets. So you can get this up to 220 stun chance with a crit, and that is freaking gross. With that in mind, the reason also that we want Jester on a team like this is that Occultist's accuracies are kind of, like, bad. So Sack Stab at 100? People talk about Leper accuracy, this thing is pretty bad itself. And then Hands from the Abyss at 110 is not usually considered guaranteed against a rank 3 like Cultist Witch or Spitter Pig or something like that. So having Jester to fix the accuracy on this move is awesome. Plus look at these crit modifiers that this character has. He has 13 on Hands from the Abyss, he has 9 on Hex, he has another 9 on Curse, and then Sacrificial Stab has another 13. So you're stacking more crit from Battle Ballad on top of that, which means Occultus becomes the stress healer of this team because every time he's hitting stuff, he's critting and he's healing the team with, uh, or he's stress healing the team because of it. And he's also sticking his stuns even more reliably because he's critting. So, Occultus is very important to this team. This team runs actually just well when everyone's doing what they're supposed to, but I guess that's what all teams are supposed to be doing. So, we have Hands from the Abyss, probably the best stun in the game. It lowers torch, so when you bring Occultus and you're going to stun with him, make sure you buy extra torches. We have Hex, because we have two other people that need Mark on the team, and this really gives Occultus something to do when he's not stunning. We have the heal, even though the heal's inconsistent in terms of what it can roll. It's still really good to have, and the rule of thumb with Occultist is you do not want to be healing when someone's at Death's Door. The reason people hate Occultus is because when they hit zero and Occultist tries to heal, he also hits zero and then he bleeds them, which is the, you know, the meme. And the reason you don't want that to be happening is because Occultus can roll zero. You should be healing when people are at about half HP, not when they're dying. But this is also why we have Arbalest on the team. So we have also Sacrificial Stab. This could be Weakening Curse if you really want to, but we have Sac Stab just because it's a melee attack and it hits rank 1. And then, like I said, for Trinkets, it's very recommended that you have the DLC. If not, then you can run like a Stun Amulet instead of Violent Sand. But Violent Sand is just so nutty as a Trinket that I really think that if you have the DLC, this thing should be on. Then we have Demon's Cauldron, which is a cultist personal trinket. This gives him another 3 crit, and the virtue chance and bonus stress doesn't really matter because he's critting all of the time. So unless you're playing Torchless or he just gets focus fired by stress casters, he's not going to afflict. We have Bounty Hunter. So Bounty Hunter is interesting. He doubles as like a damage dealer and the setup character, which is Bounty Hunter's like core issue, which is why if you run two Bounty Hunters together, they get a lot stronger. So we have Collect Bounty, this is just huge damage against Mark Targets and Human Subtypes. We have Mark for Death, this is to help Arbalest and also shred protection off enemies because sometimes enemies do have protection, like enemies you wouldn't expect to have protection. So things like the ones in the Wield, uh, some of the slime, the big slime, and the Fungal Artillery and the Fungal Scratchers, they all have prot that you have to be worried about. 
and this helps deal with it. Virgo has prod for some freaking reason I don't understand. So we have ways to deal with it, and then bandits. Then we have flashbang. This could be uppercut, but honestly, uh, we have a cultist who should be stunning rank one if needed, and then at that point, bounty hunter is killing it. So I think flashbang is better than uppercut in this team specifically, but uppercut itself is an incredible move, so don't sleep on it. And if you want to run that instead, I would not blame you. We have finish him. This is specifically for the reach. Uh, collect bounty cannot hit rank three, which is very unfortunate. So finish him is kind of an anti-synergy move because usually if you stun something, you're not trying to kill it that turn. But this still comes into play because sometimes you stun a rank one enemy with a cultist, so you get the damage bonus by hitting it, and that's fine. But this is primarily to hit rank three. That's all it's there for. For trinkets, again, more CC trinkets. We have the bag of teeth. So this is crime lord's molars. This thing just getting one bonus effect, so if they're marked or stunned or bleeding, it's 20% bonus damage, and that's already pretty freaking good. It's very easy with this team to get two of these effects on something, like mark and stun, or mark and bleeding, or stun and bleeding, and then you have 40% bonus damage. That is starting to get into some pretty huge numbers. So if you use this on top of collect bounty, on top of mark, so like, let's say we have two of these, so we have 40% bonus damage, and then we have Collect Bounty, which is another 90% bonus damage. So that's 130% bonus damage against like one target. You're already more than doubling your damage. That is freaking gross. Like your base damage is probably like 18 to whatever the hell at that point. And that is absolutely nuts. And then we have Hunter's Talent. This is just better focus ring. This is Bounty Hunter exclusive. If you run this trinket, make sure that you take it off when you camp. So you don't have to worry about consuming extra food. But it's just all upsides. This thing is incredible. Jester. This is the primary engine of the team. Occultist is pretty necessary, but it's really Jester that makes this team go. So we have Battle Ballad. This is the best just party buff in the game. This thing is completely broken. This is one of the best skills in the game. And you hit it once, it's already giving your entire party like two extra trinkets. You hit it a second time, and you can stack it. Like, absolutely absurd. You're going first, you're critting, you're getting stress healing, you're not missing, they're dying. This move, like, this ability is so absolutely broken. Inspiring Tune, if you need it, Usually you don't. Usually your stress levels are pretty manageable without it, so you don't have to worry about that. We have Dirk Stab, because Bounty Hunter and Occultist don't mind being moved back one or two spots. So, like, Bounty Hunter can still do literally his entire kit. That's another reason not to run Uppercut, is Bounty Hunter can use his entire kit from rank 3. So if Jester Dirk Stabs to use Finale, Bounty Hunter doesn't lose a single thing. So we have Dirk Stab to set up Finale, do a little bit of extra damage, then we have Finale to just blow up a big threat. There are two primary ways to use Finale. The first is to drop it on like turn three to blow up, you know, some medium sized threat. And then the other is to charge it up like six or seven or eight turns. Eight turns is usually the max. And then blow up something that's like super threatening, like an actual boss, like Shambler. So having this setup we give ourselves Finale, but you can also run Slice Off to get Bleeding, and that sets up the Bag of Teeth. So you're very flexible in this regard. But I, I'm not sure which I like better. Because if you set up Bag of Teeth with the Bleed, you get more consistent damage, but Finale is just like, good in terms of finishing fights. Also, if you get thrown up to rank one on turn one, like you get surprised, then you can Finale. It's not advised, but it's a solid way to get back and like not lose too much tempo. For Trinkets, you can swap one of these. I'm just showing you two different options. Like, everyone thinks of Dodge Jester, so this Jester would be up to 56 right now because of a uh, quirk. And this is good. But we also have Barristan's Head, and Protection on Jester is surprisingly good. Even though he has some solid dodge, he does get hit from time to time. And being able to shrug off chunks of damage gives him a lot of survivability that he otherwise doesn't have. And Prod is more consistent than dodging, so definitely don't sleep on giving him protection but I would advise against Heavy Boots just because he needs all the speed that he can find. Finally, we come to Arbalest. She is the primary damage dealer in the opening rounds, and then she's support for the closing rounds. So the way I always describe Arbalest play is she's shooting on ranks one and two, or turns one and two, and then on turns three, four, and five, she's usually healing or supporting. So we have Sniper Shot. We have two ways to set up Mark on this team, so she doesn't need to set up her own Mark and she's usually slow enough that it doesn't matter. Mine currently has quick reflexes, but I haven't locked it in, so there you go. But yeah, we set up Mark with one of the other characters, and then Arbalest shoots rank four, 
and then we work our way to rank 3, and then after that Arbalest is healing. Suppressing Fire is a very strong move. It's also made stronger by some kind of debuff chance, so either Bedtime Story or Wrathful Bandana. These are both pretty good for uh, Suppressing Fire. This debuff only lasts two turns, but the minus accuracy is important. But I want you to look at the minus crit. So the way Suppressing Fire works against enemy crit is in most cases, like the vast majority of cases, if this sticks one time, the minus 19% crit debuff, you are not going to get crit by that unit. It's like mathematically impossible for most units to crit you at that point, and that's fantastic. So don't sleep on this, it does some chip damage. There are some applications to it, like sometimes the backline is super prod heavy and you don't want to deal with it, or Swinatar retreats to the back and he's getting ready to charge you, so you use Suppressing Fire. The Giant Worm in the Warrens, you can all see Suppressing Fire on that. Lots of good applications for this move. Battlefield Bandage, this is why Occultus is okay to run heal. Usually Occultus can still do okay with solo healing, but you don't want him to be solo healing, especially a frontline Occultus. So having some kind of off healer that's consistent is a good way to deal with when he rolls zero. So if we have Occultus focusing on stuns, he throws out like some garbage heal, we still have Arbalest there to pick someone off Death's Door so they don't die. This is just a good move, and this is what you're doing on your last turns. Then we have Flare just to get rid of some stealth if the enemy has stealth but it can miss, which I hate quite a lot. And the minus stress, or the stress heal I should say, just doesn't matter. This is really here to clear stun and mark, which is why it's okay if your Arbalest is a couple points of speed lower than the rest of the party. For Trinkets, we're running the Crimson Court set. You don't have to run this, but this really puts together a lot of stats for her. So we have bonus healing, minus stress, those are both pretty good. We have prod for the whole set, which is fantastic. And then bedtime story does so much in one trinket. So it gives R some extra accuracy against rank four and rank three units, which she already has really good accuracy, but she's not quite hit capped by herself. So this gets her there. Unless she's using a cultist mark, then he gets her there too. So that's fine. But it gives her 8% bonus crit against mark targets. And Arbalest as a hero scales very hard off of crit. So her crit, you know, anytime she does a crit, because you have this trinket and then sniper shot gives you bonus 13% crit against mark targets on top of the plus 9 that it already has, so it's plus 22% crit, uh, yeah, crit for this one move. And with her baseline here, this is, this move right here is at 32% crit by itself. This trinket puts you to 40. That's pretty good, right? And so Arbalest has a critical buff. So if you never noticed, units that score critical hits receive a buff for a certain amount of time. Arbalest crit buff is bonus damage against marked targets up by 33%. So anytime she crits something, she starts to snowball. And so if she crits back to back, she can hit like 60 damage very easily. So don't sleep on crit, it's very good for her. And then we don't care about the move skill chance because I don't like Bola. People say Bola's fine, but I think Bola still sucks. And then we have debuff chance to help the Suppressing Fire. The way this team operates is on turn one, Jester uses Battle Ballad, Occultus probably stuns some threat in one of the front spots, and then Bounty Hunter marks rank four, Arbalest shoots rank four, rank four usually dies. Turn two, probably a second stack of Battle Ballad, you mark rank three with someone else, it could be Occultus, it could be Bounty Hunter, it really depends who goes first, then Arbalest shoots it, and then after that, you're chilling. And so we have, from that point, we have two stuns, we have flashbang, we have hands from the abyss to work on the front two units. Arbalest can sit there and spam heal. Jester can hit Dirk stab and then use finale afterwards. A rule of thumb though, you don't always have to mark with mark teams. It's just helpful sometimes. Marking is usually somewhat of a tempo loss, not a huge one, but it can be a tempo loss and that's not usually ideal, but Mark really excels in those hardier units, especially on Blood Moon and Stygian when they get more HP. Like, if you're thinking, oh, I crit for 45 against something that has 20 HP, why do I need Mark? Well, sometimes you need to crit a backliner that has 35 or 40 HP, and then sometimes also you fight size 2 enemies, so they're really big enemies. And Mark does a very good job against those, and then Mark is also very good against bosses. So Mark does have a lot of applications, even though it's not the best thing to do against Really squishy targets, but it's still not even bad in that case. I'm not gonna lie, this team is probably the strongest one on this list, or in this video. This team is like, absolutely disgusting. The reason is the combination of Plague Doctor and Flagellant is one of the just most controlling 
oppressive combos out there. It has some really good synergy with, like, the two of them have a lot of synergy with each other. They destroy backline pairs like no one's business, and once they are out of backline targets, you can, you know, bleed out the front ones and stall, which is pretty nice. So this team, it's like two pairs together. So Plague Doctor and Flagellant, amazing together. Houndmaster and Bounty Hunter, also very, very good together. I wouldn't say they're the same power level as the other two, but they're very strong together. Starting off with this Flagellant here, Punish, this is your default attack move. So you just run this, no reason not to. Reign of Sorrows, same deal. You need this on your opening turns with Plague Doctor to crush backlines. And then we have Exsanguinate, which is a very good low health skill. And then you can run Redeem if you want to, but Flag is kind of main healer also on this team. So Reclaim gets really good for main healing. So I like these four together, but you can swap one of these for Redeem if you really want to. But it's a little bit harder to set this up. So if you wanted to run Redeem, I would actually take off Exsang and I would take off the Flesh Heart. Like, I would not give him bleed resist at that point, just so he could, like, bleed himself with this, then Plague Doctor cures him as needed, and then you could use Redeem. But that's some advanced play, and I know a lot of people watching this probably don't feel comfortable with that, but Reclaim, even though it can bleed Flagellant, the main point of it, besides healing another unit with a very powerful heal over time effect, is bleeding Flagellant so he can get his low health stuff. That's the short end of it. I made a Flagellant guide if you need further explanation. Our Trinkets... We're using Flesh Heart just because this almost makes Flagellant bleed immune to his own Reclaim, which is great. And then it gives him 15% uh, HP on top, which is just good. We have Signet Ring because this synergizes pretty well with Flesh Heart. So anytime you stack Prot and HP together, it gives you a lot of effective HP. And that's really nice to have. And then we have a, bunch, or a little bit of extra accuracy so we can hit those backline units. You could run Bleed Charm or Bleed Amulet in here instead. Pardon the mess of this trinket box but I just passed it. So you run this thing instead, which is extra bleed skill chance and bleed resist, which means that the reclaim bleed chance evens out, so you get like no positive or negative from this, but it does help you stick the bleed just that much easier. So we have Houndmaster with the Crimson Court set. Since Flagellant is Crimson Court, you need this DLC to play this team, but because of that, we can actually run a Crimson Court set and not feel bad about it. So Crimson Court set just great overall. We have a lot of bleeds going on in the team, so why not use the Evidence of Corruption and the Lawman's Badge, which gives us more damage against bleeding targets. The Evidence of Corruption also gives us 25% scouting, that's nuts. Minus Surprise Chance, that is also nuts. This is almost, this is arguably better than Ancestor's Map if you can handle traps. So we have the Lawman's Badge, which is okay. I really don't like this thing as its own, like, singular trinket. Like, I never run this thing by itself in most cases, but... The reason you run it is strictly for the 15% accuracy. Or the 15 accuracy, I should say. That's that's the only reason you run it. You don't really care about the rest of it. The min or the plus stress healing in camping is fine. The healing skills with Lick Wounds is fine, but you're not running Lick Wounds sometimes. And then we have minus stun and debuff resist, so you're kind of incentivized not to guard. And then the minus debuff affects target whistle, but even at minus 20 target whistle... Oh, no, it's... I thought it was debuff chance, it's debuff resist, excuse me, I was about to go on a tangent, but yeah. So for moves, we are running Hound's Rush, this is single target damage, this is fine. We have Hound's Harry, this is Cleave, this puts bleed on everything so Hound Master can set up his own set bonus again, so you can actually just spam this and get 25% damage bonus and 5% crit, which is cool. We have Guard because there's no reason not to run Guard, even though I suck at pressing this button. Like, people will make fun of me for it, I've lost like three characters because I forget to press this button, or I forget that it lasts one turn. So remember the guard dog lasts one turn only, it says two, but it actually ticks down the first turn. So guard dog is solid, it's never bad to have guard. You could run Lick Wounds if you really wanted to because of the Lawman's Badge, but I feel like this team doesn't need it, so I don't put it on. And then we have Blackjack, which is to stun the frontline stuff and sometimes rank three. It's just good. For... Bounty Hunter, I forgot to change the moves here, but you know what, this this set actually still works, surprisingly, go figure. So with, because um, I changed the trinkets, but not the, uh, the move set, but we have Collect Bounty for Mark Synergy and Human Damage Bonus. We have Mark to set up Houndmaster, so we can like Mark a big beefy dude, and Houndmaster can run into it for bonus damage, and then Bounty Hunter can hit it the next turn for bonus damage, which is cool. Then we have Flashbang because more stuns is good, we already have rank 1 stuns, so Flashbang is fine for the rest of it. Then we have finish him for reach. You usually don't need this, so this is like your most flexible move. 
And then for trinkets, we have stun amulet to help six stuns. Then we have hunter's talent because it's just that good. As I said in the previous team segment, make sure you take this off when you're camping so you don't eat extra food. You don't need to take this off during a hallway hunger check because it doesn't apply to it. When I say it doesn't apply to it, I mean that the percentage isn't 100%, so you never eat double food, and that's pretty cool, so don't worry about that. Plague Doctor here with another DLC trinket, but this is the pretty standard Plague Doctor loadout. You can move these characters around too, by the way. You could put Plague Doctor in 3 and run Incision and put Houndmaster in 4 and Bounty Hunter in 2. This team is pretty flexible like that, but I, I like it this way the most so far. So we have Blight, Blight, Double Stun, and Battlefield Medicine to cure status, especially because Plague Doctor is so fast she can cure other people before they have to deal with stuff. And this also gets rid of Reclaim's Bleed Effect if you need to. For Trinkets, as I said before, the Vial is something that puts Plague Doctor into a god tier character. Like, if she doesn't have this, she's still solid, but this really makes her incredible. So you should be getting this. I can't, I can't recommend something to replace this, except maybe Prophet's Eye, but that's just because this thing is so strong individually that it's really hard to find enough value in one other trinket to offset what you lose from not running this. We have the Ashen Distillation. This gives PD 20 extra dodge. If you, actually just baseline. I thought the dodge was conditional, excuse me. Yet healing received is conditional, and then you get bonus play chance. The reason we have to stack so much Blight Chance is because this team doesn't do that well in the Ruins just because of the huge bleed resist. And so if we run this team somewhere else, like the Warrens, the Wield, or Crimson Court, then Blight Chance, or I should say Blight Resist, gets much higher. That's just the nature of the, uh, the regions. So we need to be able to punch through that Blight Resist with Blight Chance. And stacking both of these trinkets gets us there. The way to play this team is about as close to solitaire as you're going to get in this game. And that's just because they're very fast, so they can control the entire fight. They have a bunch of stuns. Like, there are three different stuns on this team. Technically four if you include Flagellant Dying as a stun move. And so on turn one, we drop Rain of Sorrows with Flage, and then we use Blinding Gas with Plague Doctor. Turn two, a second hit of Rain of Sorrows, and then Plague Grenade. And at this point, they have two stacks of Rain of Sorrows, one stack of Plague Grenade, and they're just coming off a stun or whatever, and so they're taking a bunch of damage. And then, no joke, turn three, you can throw another Blinding Gas, and they just bleed out and they're gone. Like, this team gets rid of both backline units by turn three so consistently that it's absolutely gross. That's why I like this team so much. That's why Plague Doctor and Flagellant are so good together is because they just wipe out backlines with no issue. Unless, of course, there's some kind of two-space enemy in the back, which is pretty rare, but that does happen. I'm looking at you, Swinitar, and Ghoul. So if you're not running into that stuff, then you can wipe out both of them, but they still do so much damage that even size twos go down. Houndmaster and Bounty Hunter are spending the other turns either stunning frontliners or setting up marks and softening up the, uh, the bigger targets or even helping out with cleaning up the back line. So like one Hound's Harry on top of the huge amounts of damage over time from the other two characters, it's so consistent and safe to get rid of enemies this way. And then after that, you're just chilling. You get rid of the front line after that and you rotate your remaining stuns and mark when you want to blow something up and then just start dropping Reclaim. That's probably the best time to start using Reclaim is once you're down to like one or two frontliners because the healing will pick you back up for the next fight. This final team is pretty simple and effective and it's an antiquarian team so you can safely farm with it. This team is good both early game and late game so don't worry about what point of the adventure you are in. And like I said, it's pretty simple and straightforward so let's start talking about it. So we have Hellion, we have Iron Swan which is the best skill in the bar. We have Yop just to stun stuff, this could be something else. We have If It Bleeds for reach and bleed damage, and then we have Bleed Out because I want you to get used to using Bleed Out. This move is absolutely gross, it does so much damage. You want to use this at the end of the fight to clean up the last target, you don't want to use this at the start because of the damage penalty. For Trinkets, we're running a bunch of accuracy, so we have Surgical Gloves and we have Heaven's Hairpin. These are, like they're good, they're early, like, early mid game Trinkets. Um, they're both a little bit tough to find, but if you can get something like this, you're good enough. And then we have 8% crit, which is good. Oh yeah, and then we have minus 25% stress. So, and everyone's playing at high torch, so that's why these things are still fine and dandy. Look at that, Vessel's running the exact same stuff, except she has a baby version of the loadout I usually suggest for trinkets. And Aquarian, this is where it gets interesting. So Anti uses these three moves primarily. 
but you can switch stuff around depending on what point in the game you're in. So if you're in early game, the dodge vapors aren't that good. The heal is pretty crap, but it's still one point. Flash powder is amazing at all points in the game, and protect me is also very good as well. If you are early game, you might swap this for maybe, I guess nothing actually. I think this is still worth running, but early game festering vapors isn't that good. It's like one on hit damage and like two damage over time. That's pretty crappy. And the nervous stab is actually better from like level zero to two. But after that, I think, what is it? Festering vapors starts to pull ahead in terms of damage. I did make an antiquarian guide if you've not watched it already, but the long story short with flash powder is the debuff chance on this move is solid and then the minus accuracy is very powerful so what you do is you pick the one thing you want to destroy so that's what hellion and highwayman are doing for the first turn you pick the one thing that you need to stun and then you stun that and then whatever is left that's also a big threat usually some kind of melee monster is what gets hit by flash powder repeatedly if you don't want to use flash powder for slowing stuff down usually at the end of the rounds i should say so near the end of the fight, Flash Powder gets better, but for the first one or two turns, you should be using Protect Me. So Protect Me goes on Highwayman to give him a second way to get repost, which is where a lot of the damage on this team comes from. For Trinkets, we're using the Fleet Florin just because it's speed, this lets Antiquarian set up before anything else happens, and then you get debuff chance for Flash Powder. We have Feather Crystal again for the bonus speed, and then the bonus dodge is pretty nice in case something for some reason outspeeds her and you don't have Protect Me Up yet, and then you can still have a chance at dodging stuff. Highwayman, we have Duelist Advance, this is the bread and butter of the team. So the whole goal is to press Duelist Advance to get Repost up, then use Protect Me to force Highwayman to guard her, and then after that you have two targets that can trigger Repost. That makes it way better, so any cleave can set off Repost, any direct attack against Antiquarian will set off Repost, and then Dismas getting hit normal, or I should say Highwayman, getting hit normally sets off for post. This is also why we stack accuracy. We have pistol shot for the range, we have point blank in case we end up in rank 1, but this is actually something you can get rid of. You could run really any of the other three moves at that point instead of this because it's very rare that you're going to hit rank 1 with a team like this, with uh, specifically this team. And then open vein if the enemies can bleed, and then wicked slice if they cannot. Pretty much only the ruins is where I bust this out. Like even in the cove this is still solid because sometimes it sticks. And the minus speed penalty, as well as the bonus accuracy, makes us pretty good compared to the Wicked Slice damage bonus. For Trinkets, we're running some low-level stuff. We have Surgical Gloves to boost our repost value. And then we have Reckless Charm, which is just 5 accuracy on Pistol Shot and Repost and the other melee skill. For this team, Hellion opens with Iron Swan. If it doesn't die, she probably does it a second time. If Pistol Shot doesn't kill it, and then after that, it's if it bleeds, and then if it bleeds again and then probably bleed out to finish the fight. With Vestal, you can start Highwayman in rank 3 instead of 2, or not 2, instead of 4 if you want to, so that you don't have to worry about the single target healing, but you usually don't have to. You can run the team as it's listed and do just fine, or then switch it if you need to, like after a fight. And so we have Dazzling Light for the first couple turns, because you're going to mitigate more damage than you probably need to heal by stunning stuff, which is very nice. And then after Highwayman has Duelist Advanced past her, if she doesn't have to group heal, she can just use single target heals, and then Judgment if it's worth using. In Aquarian has two different openers in this team. She can open with Flash Powder if the situation calls for it, which is something that does take some experience. And then she can open with Protect Me. Usually if the enemy has a very high likelihood of targeting an Aquarian, I will probably open with Protect Me, but if it's got like a size two enemy, or some kind of like really big bruiser that I have to get rid of, or at least sideline very quickly, then I will start stacking Flash Powder, especially if her post doesn't get much value in that fight. And then if you do go the Protect Me route, you just drop it on Highwayman for like the first two turns, use Dual Advance, Highwayman just blows up everything that attacks him, ideally. And then after that, you can use Flash Powder to bully the remaining enemies and spam healing moves to recover. Highwayman also has a flexible opening. You could use the Duelist Advance into Protect Me combo on turn 1, or just Duelist Advance on turn 1, or you could use Pistol Shot. If you have a very dangerous rank 4 enemy like Madman, and you hit with Iron Swan, I am probably going to use Pistol Shot like 100% of the time to try and get rid of that unit instead of worrying about reposting the rest of them. There are some enemies that have to go down as quickly as possible, and if Repost doesn't help you do that, you're not pressing it. 
Otherwise, once the tough backline, or I should say the threatening backline enemies are gone, you're gonna be spending the rest of the turn just hitting Wicked Slice, Pistol Shot, then a second Duelist Advance to close out the fight, and that's usually pretty chill and easy to do. Alright, y'all, that's gonna do it for this one. Thanks for watching. Let me know what you're thinking down below. If you like the video, give it a thumbs up. If you want to come talk about it, then join Discord. If you also want to check out Patreon for some cool stuff, go ahead and do so. And then finally, I stream on Twitch four days a week, usually Darkest Dungeons, sometimes some other games. So if you want to go check that out, then you are free to do that as well. So yeah, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.